呃，那我们现在就正式进入本次呃讲座。呃，尊敬的穆斯托教授，各位听众，大家好，欢迎参加由中山大学马克思主义哲学与中国现代化研究所主办的马克思主义哲学国际前沿论坛。我是主持人顾小坤，今天是本系列论坛的第二讲。我们非常荣幸地邀请到了加拿大约克大学马塞洛·穆斯托教授。穆斯托教授是国际知名的马克思学专家，是学术界公认近十年来为马克思主义复兴做出重要贡献的学者之一。穆斯托教授的专著被翻译成二十多种语言，在世界范围内广泛传播。已经翻译为中文的有三部《马克思的大纲》《政治经济学批判大纲》一百五十年，《今日马克思》。另一个马克思对中国学界的马克思主义哲学研究产生了积极影响。今天，呃，穆斯托教授的讲座主题是马克思对战争和劳工运动的历史重建。进行评论对话和学术翻译的是中山大学马德所助理教授张敏兰。讲座的主体部分，我们将请穆斯托教授做一个小时左右的学术报告，张敏兰助理教授做概括性学术翻译，与穆斯托教授进行评论互动。讲座的最后环节预留半个小时，请听众提问。大家可以把自己感兴趣的问题打在评论区，我们请穆斯特教授来选择回应。那下面我们就把会议的主场交给两位学者。你们。Um, dear Professor Mosto and the audience, hello everyone. Welcome to the international lecture series on Marxist philosophy, organized by Institution of Marxist Philosophy and Chinese Modernization at Sun Yat-sen University. This is the second lecture of the whole series. I am the host, Professor Xiao Kun Hu, and it is our honor today to have Professor Marcelo Mosto from Canada York University. Professor Mosto is an internationally well-known expert in the studies of Marxism and the Karl Marx. He is recognized as、uh, he is recognized by academics as one of the most important scholars. To have made a significant contribute to the revival of Marxism in the last decade, Professor Mosto's work has been translated into over 20 languages and published worldwide. Three of his books has been translated into Chinese and had a positive impact on the study of Marxist philosophy in Chinese academia. The theme of Professor Mosto's lecture today is the brutality of war and the response of labor movement: a historical reconstruction. With commentary and academic tran translation by Assistant Professor Milan Zhang from Institution of Marxism and Su at Sun Yat-sen University. During the main part of the lecture, Professor Mosto will give a speech first. Then Assistant Professor Zhang will translate the main point of lecture briefly and、uh, give a comment in both Chinese and English. We have reserved half an hour for the questions from the audience at the end of the lecture. So, if you'd like to ask a question, please type your question in. Advance in English in the chatting area, and Professor Mosto will choose to respond. Now, now let's welcome Professor Mosto. Good morning, everybody. For me, but good evening for you that、uh, are in China. Um, I'm extremely、uh, grateful for your invitation, and I'm actually delighted to see that there are 150 people at this talk, and perhaps even more later. <clears throat>、uh, your university, Sun Yat-sen University, is one of the few. Major Chinese university that I could not visit in person during my many academic visit in China, but I have、um, many、uh, good friends and colleagues there, and I hope to、uh, be able to visit you in person very soon. For the moment, I am um, um, very glad to be in your seminar. I saw that you are organizing many interesting lectures, and today I wanted to contribute with something. Uh, in relation to labor movement, in relation to、um, labor history. <clears throat> Sorry,、um, I did this in relation to war because war is、uh, um, one of the main preoccupations that we are discussing out now, nowadays in our society. And、um, what I wanted to do today, with the risk of being superficial, with the risk of, you know,、uh, perhaps、um, reading too many quotations,、um, which is something that I usually、uh, try to avoid, is trying to、um, explain to our audience that. 
today we are facing very dramatic debates and very dramatic um, circumstances. We are talking once again about the risk of a, a nuclear bomb, of nuclear power to be used. But I wanted to say that these debates are not something new. And uh, the left labor movement, socialism, communist tradition has a very long and very rich tradition in discussing war, in discussing these things. So what I would like to do today will be to come back to the main, again, sometimes superficially, but some of the main um, uh, topic, some of the main debates, some of the major elaboration made by uh, the major thinkers of the labor movement, but also what concretely working class did in front of war and try to see if perhaps this with the help of the audience with questions, if these things are useful for us today, useful to understand war, useful to prevent, once again, what I wanted to call also in my title, the brutality of war, the disaster of war, which is something that is always paid by working class, by the people. By doing this, I will start um, with the first international. So I will try to overview 150 years of uh, history of labor movement in front of war. And I wanted to say that in my opinion, one significant contribution that the socialist movement provided, first of all, in relation to the explanation of war, what creates a war, what are the major causes of a war, is the fact that differently from explanations of the past, where there were you know, many things related to the character of a king, character of a queen, of a monarch. In this case, war is connected to the mode of production. Labor movement, starting from the first international, of course, they do not ignore the ideological and sometimes also psychological motivations of war, but war is strictly connected to the development of capitalism. Spreads on wars and capitalism are connected. And in the first international, in particular, one leader, perhaps not known enough, he was the most significant figure in Belgium. His name was César de Pep. He said that actually war are inevitable under regime of capitalist production. So this is very interesting because um, there is a different explanation and then there is a very radical demand to have a final abolition of all wars. Some of these ideas at the time might sound a little bit utopian, right? If we look at this today, but I want to say, and you know, Karl Marx himself uh, was skeptical of some of these things. For example, the fact that workers could organize a strike against war in favor of peace. Because if we do the always essential exercise of bringing our theories, the text that we are reading in historical context, then we understand that, of course, it is already very difficult for the working class to do a strike in order to defend their um, um, welfare state, social conditions, to improve their working uh, position in, in that society. But later, decades after decades, war became particularly, as you will see very soon, in a few minutes I will go there, with World War I, became an essential element of survival of the working class, because Europe was the center of a brutal and unprecedented war that created millions of deaths in many uh, European countries. So what seems to be utopian at the beginning, uh, actually later started to be, you know, essential. And I want to say that Cesar de Pep and then many other leaders of the first international, they called internationalism as a cardinal point of future society. So this is very important for us because one of the points that I want to call to your attention, that I want to highlight to your attention, is the fact that labor movement is trying to push forward an internationalist agenda, which is, of course, very difficult to achieve sometimes, while on the contrary, 
nationalistic parties, you know, you know the fever, the, the, the famous study of uh, Eric Obspan, for example, you know, the birth of nationalism, nationalism here. We are talking about this period, the beginning of the second half of the 19th century. Well, they are calling in favor of uh, um, patriotic, uh, nationalist and chauvinist ideas. This is the context. In this context, I would like to do a brief mention to Marx, and then I want to focus on Engels, because I believe that Engels' elaboration of war was much more significant than Marx for many reasons. Marx was focusing on the critique of um, capitalist um, economy, and he had to write about you know, political economy. Engels, on the contrary, was called as some of the young students here might not know, the general. So Engels was always a specialist of war, strategies of war. And actually, you will see that at the end of his life, he published a series of articles, Can Europe Disarm? They were published in 1893, two years after he, he died, just to let you understand how important this topic was. But let me go back to Marx. In uh, a very famous quotation from Capital, published in 1867, volume one, of course, Marx wrote that violence is the midwife of every old society pregnant with a new one. But I want to say that Marx did not believe that war is a sort of shortcut in order to create the communist society. And actually, in his political activity, Marx was always very faithful to the principle of international solidarity. And he also did this in relation to very complicated issues, like, for example, the relationship between British and Irish workers at the time where this was a, a very big topic. So Marx did not write about uh, um, these issues. Let's say that when Marx is writing about what we call today IR, international relations, he always had an anti-Russian position against Tsarist Russia. But why this? Because Marx considered Russia, and not only Marx, as the outpost of counter-revolution. And one of the main barriers, one of the main obstacles for the working class to achieve emancipation in Europe. Why? Because every time there is a struggle in Europe, Russia is intervening and helping the counter-revolution or the liberal European government, you know, to to attack, to kill, you know, workers and the struggles of the working class. But Marx is changing this position at the end of his life when Marx saw that actually there were uh, interesting social movements and political movements. One of them was, you know, the Russian populism, which at the time meant anti-capitalism. The scholars of Marx are familiar with this letter written to Vera Zasulich and other leaders where Marx saw the possibility of the revolution starting not in the most capitalistically developed country, England, for example, but what we call, you know, the periphery or what some people will call today the global south, which is what happened in 1917 in Russia, which is what happened in 1949 in China. But let me leave now the topic of revolution and let me focus on the elaboration of Engels. This elaboration at the time is done with this pamphlet, with this newspaper article, but it is also done with many important letters to the leaders of the workers' movement. So when today young scholars, young students, they want to understand the intervention of Marx and Engels, they have to read, of course, their texts, but they also have to read their letters written to some of the most important uh, members of, uh, of labor parties, of socialist, social democratic parties of the time, because in those letters they were trying to do a sort of, you know, political work in order to convince them. You cannot always write a book or an article about something. And sometimes in these letters there are very valuable ideas that Marx and Engels could not develop in larger texts. So what is the position of Engels? The position of Engels is that in Europe, there is a risk of a war of extermination, not less than this. Engels is seeing that 
the European countries in the 20, 25 years before the end of the 19th century, starting from you know, the beginning of the 70s. And I'll tell you very soon why with a very significant historical example, in my opinion, they started to do war in terms of war preparation. What did it mean? This meant that um, this country are buying an unprecedented level of ammunition, unprecedented levels of arms production, and they are um, sort of ready for a war of destruction that according to Engels, let me read a quotation, the system of standing armies has been carried to such extremes through good Europe that it must either bring economic ruin to the peoples on account of the military burden or else degenerate into a general war of extermination. 1893, the series of articles mentioned before, Can Europe Disarm? This happened 25 years after the beginning of World War I in 1915, 22 years. So Engels is calling about another important thing that we should consider very carefully. And today and later, I'm going to mention an author who, in my opinion, has written relevant things about this, which is uh, Simon Weil. The question that sometimes this power to the military, this uh, um, expenditure of uh, ammunition, of uh, um, you know, war preparation, etc., it is not only done for the external enemy like the other country with uh, which we might fight later, but it is also done for the internal enemy. And the internal enemy, according to Friedrich Engels, is the proletariat, is the working class. So paradoxically, I want to call the attention of the audience on this point. Somebody should unmute. Number one is that uh, war is going to delay or dramatically put into trouble, you know, a socialist revolution, because for Engels, every time that there is a wave of nationalism, a wave of chauvinism, then, you know, consciousness of class struggle is going to be affected. The enemy is no longer the capitalist class, but now the enemy becomes the other worker, the people that lives in another country. That's a very important point. And I also want to tell you, why do we use civil war only when there is a war inside the same country? Like if there is a war in China between a part of China and another one, we say it is civil war. But when there is a war between China and Japan, we will not use this expression accordingly to this you know, bourgeois political theory. This is wrong. Because in, you know, international solidarity means that every human being must be treated as sisters, as brothers, as other human beings. And every time there is a war, this is bad for the working class and for the people. So there is a civil war every time. But the second point, and I will end with Engels now, is that there is also this change in the society. The society with militarism is becoming more conservative. These ideas of army, obedience, order are becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. And this will you know, give troubles to uh, the emancipatory movement of the working class. So the request of Engels is that workers leaders should fight for a gradual reduction of the terms of military service by international treaty. So this should be accepted by any countries. And they should also be in favor of a disarmament, a sort of possibility. Disarmament is for Engels is the only effective guarantee of peace, that less arms are produced or that we destroy the arms that were produced in the past. This is the debate that took place in the first international. This is mostly a theoretical debate, but this is a debate that is opening many preoccupations for the future. In 1870, there is a very important historical event the war between Russia, between Prussia and France, 
And this war is also what made possible the Paris Commune the year after in 1871. I want to say that the very few members of the parliament who belong to the German Social Democratic Party, Wilhelm Liebknecht and August Bebel, they condemned the war and they did not vote in favor of the very famous war credits. So you are in the parliament, the government is asking for more money to the war, they voted against, they rejected the bill for additional funding to continue the war. And of course, they were sent to jail and they were treated and condemned for you know, two years prison sentence because of high treasons. So this is the very beginning of what concretely happens to labor movement when there is a war and when there are uh, um, concrete uh, choices against the war. When another international, the second international was established, we're talking about 1889, 100 years after the French Revolution, at the founding Congress of the Second International, there is a very important reference to war. Please pay attention to this. Peace is considered the indispensable precondition of any emancipation of the workers, of the working class. So you can see how slowly peace is no longer, and the opposition to war is no longer a sort of peripheral argument in the platform, in the political program of the labor movement, but it's becoming a central element of labor movement. And um, socialists of the time were very critical of the political conditions that exist in France, in Europe. Do you know why? Because there was no war at the time. There was peace at the time, but they called this peace as an armed peace. There is no war, but every government is buying more ammunition, is calling more people to join the army, is starting to push forward this very dangerous vocabulary of aggression, of nationalism, of chauvinism. So everybody can understand that they are preparing war, that they're preparing society ideologically to war, that they're preparing people to the fact that killing is not the most brutal and dramatic of things, but it is an accident that can happen in the history of Europe. And the leader of the French Socialist Party. His name was uh, Jean Jaurès, very well known, very famous. He made an important speech at the French Parliament in 1895, two years after Engels wrote the text that I read to you before and was talking about of a war of extermination. And Jean Jaurès uh, uh, said, let me read this uh, well-known quotation, well-known for the historians of labor movement, your violent and chaotic society still, even when it wants peace, even when it is in a state of apparent repose, bears war within itself, just as a sleeping cloud bears a storm. So this is a very powerful quotation because Jaurès is calling to the fact that there are clouds arriving, they are very, very dark, and they are not only full of rain, full of water, but there is a storm inside. This is how socialist leader saw Europe at the time. Um, and this is happening at the time, particularly because there is a very aggressive imperial policy of Germany, right? So Germany, uh, uh, war was no longer seen as uh, only as an opening up of revolutionary opportunities and hastening the breakdown of the system. Why I read this quotation? I read this quotation because I want to take a break from the historical reconstruction that I'm doing, and I'm trying to discuss with you, or at least offer my opinion, my point of view on what is the idea of war within the labor movement. I already mentioned this before when I was talking about Karl Marx, and I said, look, be careful, Marx is not saying that violence is a sort of, you know, midwife, 
for revolution. But this is a tradition that existed in the labor movement. And this is also a tradition that we will see later, for example, in very, very important, perhaps the two most important figures of labor movement, Vladimir Lenin in Russia, in Soviet Union, and Mao Zedong in China. So they had sometimes this idea that there is an imperialistic war, and this war can be transformed into class war. I will return to this later during my lecture. But for the moment, I want to say, where is this coming from? Well, this is coming from um, French Revolution. This is coming from, in particular, uh, the Girondins that consider war, the war of 1792, as a sort of crusade, but this time a liberatory crusade. So they were talking about revolutionary war, and they say, let's um, expand to Europe what we did to France with the French Revolution. This is the idea that they had. We can export the revolution. The very um, uh, careful scholars of contemporary political theory that are listening to me might find some similitudes between this position and the very aggressive imperialist position of the United States in the last decades exporting democracy, right? How many times we heard this? So this is part of the discourse of the very beginning of the uh, socialist revolutionary movement in Europe, but not of Maximilien Robespierre. This is something very important that I want to say. Robespierre considered as a sort of, you know, violent leader, not true at all. Actually, he realized that war had never freed any foreign people. And I'm reading a quotation, liberty is not brought at a point of the bayonets. So Robespierre is against this idea of exporting the war and trying to liberate other countries with this, I don't know, um, general army trying to bring French revolution everywhere else in Europe. Look how paradoxical is history, especially when it's written by different people. Robespierre is considered a sort of bloody revolutionary, but actually he was against this idea of expanding war. And France is always associated to the person who killed more people in this period, Napoleon, right? So Napoleon is seen, is considered in a positive way. And actually Robespierre, who was against this, all the opposite. So let's return now to the labor movement. Let's return now to the story that I was mentioning, end of the 19th century with the Second International, beginning of the 20th century, the most important theoretical leader of the Second International, Karl Kowski, wrote in the book, The Social Revolution, 1902, that revolution would, in case of war, be heavily loaded with tasks that are not essential. And uh, this will make the final victory more distant rather than closer. So what is Kowski saying here? Kowski is saying, look, let's be careful to the idea of thinking that revolution, that war is going to help revolution. Because war is bringing so much destruction to our society. War is bringing so much chauvinist and nationalist ideas and ideologies in our society that it is not helping revolution, it's not making what we want to achieve faster, but it is actually creating very dramatic barriers. And with this idea, war is now seen from uh, a part, by a part of labor movement as something uh, very complicated that must be um, um, opposed. Um, of course, there are many debates, but until 1907, until the famous Stuttgart Congress of the Second International that took place in the city of Stuttgart in Germany, uh, there was a resolution that was called the Revolution on Militarism and International Conflict. Well, everybody voted in favor of this resolution. This is the last time that the left and the more moderate part of labor movement are voting together. They are voting 
against budget that increase military spending. They're voting for an antipathy to standing army and to a preference for a system of people militia. And they're voting for support, a sort of international courts of arbitration in order to settle international conflict peacefully. So what are they doing here? They are saying every time we are in parliament, we will never vote for money that will be given to do the war. We will also go against the fact that there is a standing army, a professional army, and we are in favor of people militia. It means that every year, every two years, the people who are in the army will enter, do the service, and then leave so that there is not a professional, conservative, right-wing army that will kill the working class. But the working class is in the army, a little bit like what happened in the French Revolution. And then in the end, they supported revolutionary government. And finally, they are in favor of this idea that also came from, you know, bourgeois point of view, that this should be a court of arbitration, where there is a problem between I don't know, for example, South Korea and North Korea, instead of declaring war, this country should submit their request to this court and this court should try to avoid conflicts. This is the idea that the international is pushing forward. And this is the last unanimous document that was voted at the Congress of the International. Why? because the Social Democratic Party of Germany, the SPD, had already started to support this imperialistic policy of their government. And there is this very dramatic moment in the history of labor movement, perhaps in my opinion, the most dramatic and politically relevant in terms of attack to revolutionary emancipatory ideas in the history of labor movement. The fact that some European parties or some sectors of social, social democratic European parties accepted imperialism, accepted colonialism, accepted the exploitation of people, workers in the periphery, in the south of the world, because they were receiving a benefit of this within their country. This is what Engels and Marx had already called before a sort of process of labor movement, a part of a labor movement becoming aristocracy of the labor movement in the world and using imperialism and colonialism. And on this, we must say that, you know, the elaboration of Lenin was um, very, very relevant. In this period, the accusation of this position, I mean. In this period, the Social Democratic Party of Germany has started this process, is going in this direction. But let me mention another person who was against war, who was against this position. Let me return, actually, because I mentioned already this person before, Jaurès, France. He wrote The New Army. So he is one of the scholars, one of the, sorry, leaders who focus more than anybody else on the centrality of war. He understood that war was the biggest risk that society and revolution and the emancipation of the labor movement was going to face very soon. And in this book, he made a sort of distinction between offensive and defensive war. And he is discussing what is the attitude that we should take, including where a country independence was threatened. So look the things that I told you at the beginning of my talk. I told you today we are facing dramatic events and sometimes, you know, we are um, in trouble in terms of a critical elaboration. If we go back to this rich tradition of labor movement, we can find very interesting debates discussing sometimes things that were similar to the one that we are facing today, because history does not start with us. That's why history of political thought, history of labor movement is very, very important. Also, if you want to do political theory today, sociological theory, whatever. So this is the beginning of an important debate between Jean Jaurès in France and Rosa Luxemburg in Germany. 
Jean Jaurès is a pacifist, is against war. I told you his positions before. But when Jean Jaurès is opening this possible distinction between offensive and defensive war, according to Rosa Luxemburg, is opening a very dangerous door. Because if we accept the idea that there could be a response, a war response, when there is a defensive position, like for example, the debate that we are facing today between Ukraine and Russia, for example, I'm not going to touch these contemporary things. My lecture will be very historical, but you can see some comparison with this. And actually I do history of political thought because I want to be helped in the elaboration of contemporary politics today. Well, you can see this is a defensive war. How should we look at this? So is it possible to have an intervention? Of course, many historical cases should be discussed in different ways. But what Rosa Luxemburg was arguing at the time is that number one, it is dangerous, it is risky to say what is real defensive because you can have a country that uh, is declaring war to another one, but perhaps that other country was provoking the first one to declare war. And perhaps this is the outcome that they wanted. And in any case, the question of scheme of defense aggression, it is always difficult to say. Another thing that Losa Luxemburg is mentioning, and I'm reading uh, a quotation here. So um, historical phenomena such as wars cannot be measured with the yardstick of justice or through a paper of scheme of defense and aggression. So it is necessary to bear in mind the difficulties of establishing this. And therefore, she thought that the distinction should be discarded. And he is against this idea of armed nation of Jean Jaurès because it ultimately tended to fuel the growing militarization in society. So Rosa Luxemburg is faithful to the idea that if we create army, if we increase the war apparatus, then this is something that will militarize society and will make society very um, difficult to be democratized more. Let me read in connection with this, this uh, quotation of Simon Weil. It is a quotation against the apparatus. It is a quotation against the state when it turns to be into a war machine. He said, she said, Simon Weil, this is 1933, <clears throat> in a, a very short text, which was called Reflections of War, 1933. You know, Hitler is taking power in this period. Uh, fascism in Italy already started in 1922. She said, no matter what name it may take, fascism, democracy, or dictatorship of the proletariat, the principal enemy remains the administrative, police, and military apparatus. Not the enemy across the border, who is the enemy only to the extent that they are our brothers and sisters' enemies, but the one who claims to be our defender while making us its slaves. So she's saying, be careful, because sometimes the enemy is not the other workers who lives in France, who lives in Italy, who lives in England. And this ideology of war is, you know, transforming them like people who want to kill them. This is the ideology of nationalism, but there is a very big risk that our society became a society where administration, police, military apparatus is going to control and is going to push us in this very dangerous um, spiral of war. So this is a debate that you are seeing. I think that I've already presented the main position to you. A part of German social democracy, of Italian and French socialist party, they are quickly uh, failing to maintain this principle of international solidarity and they are supporting cr war credit. So they are becoming in favor of colonialism and imperialism. 
and in fact they will be responsible of World War I, like the other bourgeois, liberal and conservative parties. Another part is against this, and this part is actually minority in the Second International. War is so important, you see, in a few years it became so uh, central and relevant to the discourse of labor movement that actually war was the reason why the Second International ended. The Second International ended because it was, it proved to be completely important in the face of war and, you know, failed the main objective, the one that I mentioned before. In 1891, the first Congress, peace is the indispensable precondition of every emancipation of the workers. And what happened now that this was not possible to preserve? So while the majority of socialists and social democratic party were in favor of this, actually um, the minority uh, joined and you know, uh, assembled in uh, conferences like the one that took place at Zimmerwald and the one that took place at Kintel, 1915, 1916. So leaders like Lenin, like Trotsky, like Rosa Luxemburg were very vigorous opponents of war. And they, they wrote, for example, um, let me read a quotation from the famous Zimmerwald confer conference. For decades, war spending will absorb the best energy of people, undermining social improvements and impeding any progress. They are following the line started by Engels. They are following the line that war is um, uh, dangerous and will postpone uh, the revolution. So Rosa Luxemburg is, in my opinion, the leader who paid more attention to this, more than anybody else. And she coined this very wonderful slogan, war on war. She said that war on war is not only very important, but this should be the cornerstone of the working class politics. So you understand the working class politics should have at the center this idea that we should avoid war in any possible way. So the main goal of the proletariat for Rosa Luxemburg is fighting imperialism and preventing war in peace as in war. So not only when there is a war going on, but also when we are in peace, labor movements should avoid this kind of attitude that were denounced by Jures, like armed peace. We are in peace, but everybody's preparing the war. The other very important text that I um, read once again with enthusiasm when I brought my uh, essay, uh, War and the Left, on which this um, lecture is based, consideration on the chapter history that is uh, uh, published by critical sociology and also partially translated into Chinese, is the text of Vladimir Lenin, Socialism and War, published in 1915. Uh, uh, so, Lenin is, in my opinion, very If there is a problem with that. Okay, now the recording is back, <clears throat> but I will not repeat, otherwise the <clears throat> audience will be a little bit bored. <clears throat> but according to Lenin, there is this question of uh, defensive war, just war, oppressed war. So Lenin is elaborating his, in this text, socialism and war. Now I'm taking, I apologize with the audience, but the interruption distracted me a little bit. The slogan, the very well-known slogan that revolutionaries should seek to turn imperialistic war into civil war. 
So this is the idea of Lenin, civil war against their governments and the bourgeoisie. Lenin was convinced that <clears throat> any class struggle consistently waged in time of war would inevitably create a revolutionary spirit among the masses. This is something that happened in, in Soviet Union, in Russia. It was possible to turn the dramatic outcome of World War I into a revolution. And Soviet Union actually was born in 1917 at the time of war. <clears throat> but it was very difficult, let me put it in this way, for the working class and for the ordinary people during this dramatic period or after this period to listen to this slogan, you know, we should do another war because a war against the bourgeoisie will turn into a revolutionary war. I'll return to this later in another historical period that is very complicated between World War I and World War II. I also must be a little bit faster, I believe, because I've already reached 45 minutes of my presentation. What I want to do now is um, demonstrating that this dramatic debate and this complicated uh, um, discussion, it is not only something that took place within the socialist and the communist movement, but it is something that took place also in the anarchist movement and in the feminist movement. So war produced division, not only in the second international, but everywhere. If we look at the you know, anarchist movement of the time, the, the perhaps the most important uh, um, figure of this movement, Peter Kropotkin, well, he came out with a surprising position. He said, the task of any person holding dear the idea of human progress is to squash the German invasion in Western Europe. This was a surprise because actually Kropotkin, who was of course an anti-militarist and remained that for all his life, but he made this calculation. Yes, we used to call general strike against war, but only a very small portion of labor movement participated to the strike. So in the end, if we are doing this, we are actually making the side of imperialism, in this case, Germany, that was at the center of this imperialistic policy at the time of World War I, stronger. So, Kropotkin was in favor of supporting a sort of coalition of less conservative countries, more democratic countries, because he said, if Germany is winning the war, then this is the end for um, Europe. And it will take you know, a generation in order to have the possibility of have a social revolution. But the majority of anarchists, including the Italian, Enrico Malatesta argued that although um, he, they were not pacifists and uh, they were in favor of wars of liberation, but in this case, and I'm reading a quotation from the manifesto that they wrote against Kropotkin, <clears throat> for the general good against the common enemy of democracy, um, yes, a German victory will have certainly spell the triumph of militarism, but also the triumphs of Russia and England, the you know, alliance against uh, Germany will have created militarism and imperialistic power. So this again reminds me a little bit what we are debating today, one side or another. Also, when we look at the intervention of the NATO it is not that that can be seen as a, a triumph of peace in uh, the face of uh, uh, Russia and what they're doing. So none of the belligerents has any rights to lay claim to civilization, just as none of them is entitled to claim legitimate self-defense. The anarchists against Kropotkin are saying, look, a milder level of imperialism is not better than 
the worst possible imperialism. And we cannot lose the working class and you know, supporting war. We should continue our ideological struggle against war. This is something, as I mentioned, I have to go a little bit faster, that also um, was related to feminist movement. Feminist movement in this period is um, using war in order to, like, you know, historical condition of this period, let's put like this, uh, help women to replace men in jobs, right? Because these men were conscripted men, they have to go to war. And this was the end of male monopoly on many jobs. But women were still working for lower wage and condition over, over exploitation, et cetera. So the idea that war is a, a possibility of emancipation is something that entered also the feminist movement for this reason, by thanks to the work of uh, women communist leaders like Clara Zetkin, Rosa Luxemburg in Germany, Sylvia Pankhurst, Alexandra Kolontai in many countries, this idea was um, uh, uh, fought back because the struggle against militarism was actually an essential element of the struggle against patriarchy, they argued, right? And the opposition to war became a sort of distinctive moment, the opposition to war budget, uh, a distinctive moment of, uh, you know, the International Women's Day, the 8th of March, and all these uh, um, uh, feminist uh, groups and movement. So this also in the end, what I'm trying to say is that war is dividing socialist movement, war is dividing feminist movement, war is even dividing anarchist movement. But in the end, there is a, a clear outcome in order to understand that uh, war is disastrous and it does not create any uh, um, level of emancipation. At this point, I want to tell you that with the end of World War I, with the dramatic outcomes of World War I, there is a period, let's say a sort of interregnum, uh, in which everybody's talking against war. As I mentioned before, nobody could say, let's do another war or, you know, war would be essential for the emancipation of the working class. But at the, at the same time, many people said, a new 1914 is inevitable. 1914 is the year, the beginning of World War I. So leading politicians, leading, you know, um, thinkers of this period, are talking against war, but actually are um, prepared to the beginning of another war. There are examples like Nikolai Bukharin, Georgi Dimitrov. I cannot spend too much time on this. And in China, the situation is very difficult because of course, China at the time was facing, you know, the brutal imperialistic aggression of, uh, Japan. And of course, if you read Mao Zedong, if you read Unprotected War of 1938, if you need Problems of War and Strategy published in the same year, of course, you see this discourse of war that is connected to liberation, liberation against oppression, like many people later um, fought against, I don't know, uh, Nazism during World War II in, in Europe. And in fact, World War II became uh, from, you know, uh, true, you know, a concrete possibility until the moment of eruption of the war. And we all know that this created um, the most dramatic um, period in contemporary history. Now, um, there is um, Soviet Union and starting from 1941, under Stalin, we are, Stalin, you know, took the power after Lenin died in 1924. In 1941, there is this so-called great, great, sorry, patriotic war. This was a central element in Russian national unity, and it survives still today. How many times we saw, even today, not just a few, few, few months ago, 
Putin, you know, being uh, in front of this big parade, remembering the great patriotic war, also, you know, with the symbol of communism, even though, you know, there is a, a very conservative and nationalist government. But what I want to tell you is that with the end of war and with the division of war into blocks, then there is this policy started actually in reality with Nikita Khrushchev in Soviet Union, starting in 1961, of so-called peaceful coexistence. So these two big powers, United States and Soviet Union, they are building so many uh, arms and they are giving so much uh, power to, you know, um, army that um, this is becoming very dangerous. It's becoming very dangerous also. There is anniversary 60 years in these uh, days of the um, Cuban crisis. Um, so um, uh, Cuban uh, missus crisis that uh, demonstrated that uh, it was a possibility to start a new um, nuclear war after what happened in Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki in Japan. So in this period, let's say that the two big powers during Cold War are starting this, you know, this courses, this possibility of reducing um, war. But in this period, and this is a critique of Soviet Union that I move forward in my article, I believe that um, this was very limited only to the external and not inside the so-called socialist bloc. I have five minutes to end my talk, so I will be a little bit more superficial here, but I'm open to discuss this with you if there are other questions. What I'm trying to say is that when there were, um, like in the case of Hungary in 1956, or I, like in the case of Czechoslovakia in 1968, where there were, <clears throat> revolts uh, within the socialist bloc, particularly um, Brezhnev talked about the idea of limited sovereignty within the Warsaw, Warsaw Pact. So I'm reading, when forces that are hostile to socialism try to turn the development of some socialist country toward capitalism, it becomes not only a problem of that country, but a common problem and concern of all socialist country. The problem, in my opinion, is that this intervention of Soviet Union in Czechoslovakia in 1968 and, you know, in Hungary, but even more in 1979 with the war in Afghanistan created the idea that actually Soviet Union is another imperialistic power. And there is no um, real attempt to make peace an essential element of labor movement. I also want to call the attention of my audience on the fact that in this period, there are the so-called new social movements uh, entering in the political scenes. For example, those in favor of feminism, those against war, those in favor of ecology. I'm talking about you know, the 60s and the 70s and even more now. And this kind of decision of Soviet Union alienated um, a significant part of this movement and you know, help to create the message that there was um, um, very little differences sometimes between Soviet Union and the United States. And there is also another dramatic event that is happening. The war, the so-called socialist war that took place between 1977 and 1979, between Cambodia and Vietnam, between China and Vietnam, these are the tensions between China and Soviet Union, and now they also resulted in the uh, Sino-Soviet conflict. Of course, you are well aware of this, and I don't have to add more element to this. So in conclusion, um, to overview before the beginning of our discussion, I believe that um, um, also, if we look at the fact that the end of the Cold War did not mean 
the so-called of promise freedom that capitalism, that United States, that you know the end of history, and all these authors who um, started to disseminate this liberal discourse uh, promised uh, at the end of uh, of Soviet Union. <clears throat> so war is uh, still very relevant in our society. What is happening in Europe is just one of the several conflict that exists in the world today. And actually there is more attention to this sometimes in terms of international solidarity because the ideological discourse of the West is stronger when it is pointed out against Soviet Union, against Russia. But it is also true that what happened with Russia was something unprecedented in the last decades on European territory, beside the fact that there is the risk of um, uh, nuclear tensions and uh, nuclear war. In my opinion, uh, without entering too much into these uh, contemporary issues and uh, continuing to you know, discuss my um, presentation in an historical way, um, I think that the left today should reconsider carefully these ideas that were also related um, to Lenin, I mentioned in socialism and war, but I also mentioned they're coming from the French Revolution, this idea of progressive wars. Like in the contemporary circumstances with the level of violence that war, that nuclear powers can you know, disseminate in the world. Is it possible to have a war that is a progressive war? I believe that rarely have wars had the democratiz uh, democratizing effect that uh, some theorists of labor movement, some theory of socialism hoped for. And actually, very often, they prove to be the worst way of carrying out the revolution because after a war, for a society like socialism, when you want to redistribute and when you want to give wealth to the population and not poverty like capitalist poverty, it is even more difficult to create this. So that's why I wanted to end my talk uh, once again referring to Simon uh, Weil to this reflection of war, she said, the only feasible, feeble, sorry, possibility that we have is that we do not want to abandon all hope and uh, um, a revolution will not be um, sent to the tomb when there is a controlling apparatus uh, that uh, leads to the total uh, effacement of the individual before um, um, the bureaucracy, before this uh, state as a war machine. And I also want to return to this well-known author. Um, I'm talking about, you know, the famous uh, Klosservitz, um, the famous author who wrote about war and the famous uh, dictum, war is the continuation of politics, right? I believe that for the left, war cannot be considered the continuation of politics by other means, as von Klosserwitz used to say. I believe that war actually certifies the death of politics, the failure of politics. And I believe that if the left wishes to reconstruct an hegemony, to fight this discourse of racism, nationalism, chauvinism that is so strong in the world from I don't know, uh, India with the BJP to Bolsonaro in Brazil, these nationalist and chauvinistic ideas are very, very strong. So many extreme right-wing neo-fascist political parties in Europe, well, then the left should uh, write um, a clear political program based on peace and the left should retake this idea of anti-militarism. So the left should write on its banners the word anti-militarism and no war. Thank you very much for your attention. 
and I would be very glad to respond to your question, criticism, and continue the discussion with you in the second part of the talk. Okay, thank you for Professor, for Professor Mostos' uh, um, lecture. So let me translate your main point briefly. Uh, okay. Um,嗯，莫斯科教授今天讲的是这个左翼对战争、对对这个战争的一个态度的问题。然后，呃，这个可以分为几个阶段。那么他首先说，我们可以从这个马克思，今年马克思主义的立场上对战争的本质进行一个分析
。那么这个时候就出现了这个分歧，也就是说，战争实际上对无产阶级造成了这个内部分化，也对女性主义运动等等造成了分化。比如说一一部分女性主义运动认为战争帮助了女性取代了男男性的地位，在工作中的地位，但是另一部分女性认为战争实际上使女性工作的时间更长，呃，在一个更差的环境下工作。总之，呃，针对战争，女性主义也产生了这个不同的分歧。那么在一战结束之后呢，大家都会。反对战争，这个时候因为战争的恶果刚刚显露出来，但是这个时候就进入了下一阶段的准备状态。那么在苏联诞生，苏联诞生以后呢，无产阶级内部针对战争的看法就进一步被分化了。那么一部分共产主义认为，在反对纳粹的时候，我们应该进行正义的战争，应该用战争解决战争，应该用武装得取政权等等。那么在欧洲战场上，也有很多人支持这个战争，把战争和解放问题联系在一起，呃。而且这导致了这个无产阶级阵营内部出现了这个以民族国家为单位的小范围的这个团结。那么接下来就是在冷战期间，美苏两个超级大国实际上处在一个和平的有一个和平的基本共识，也就是说大家都不要去搞热战。那么但是这个时候是以军备战争为基础的，呃，但是在无产阶级阵营内部实际上是有一些热战的，因为彼此都打着捍卫社会主义的旗号。那么 Mosto 教授的观点就是说，这个时候其实列呃苏联呢开了一个。坏头就是说，让我们无产阶级对战争的这个立场呢，实际上被削弱了。就是说，我们内部反而出现了很多斗争的情况，因为都要打着这个保护社会主义国家的旗号。那么，在这个背景下，新的社会主义运社会运动，就是呃 social movement， 新的社会运动在二十世纪六十年代、七十年代产生的。那么，这些社会运动在总体上来讲，实际上是比当时的苏联站在更加反战的立场上的。那么，最后。呃，莫斯科教授又举了一些现代战争的例子。总之，就是他认为，在现代的这个情况下，在核战争的这个威胁下，呃，左翼在这个西方有很多激进的民族主义的右翼的情况下，更应该站在反对战争的立场上，认为战争并不是呃政治的延续，战争肯定会带来一个一个更加糟糕的情景，而且也是一个民主革命的坏的方式。那么，以上就是我的我的这个概括，嗯、呃。Okay, I'm I, I'm going to start the the comment in English first. Um. Uh, so Professor Musto had uh, made a very clear point in this lecture that uh, the left should say no to militarism and wars under any circumstances. There is a no less evil war or a just war because the essence of modern war is a capitalist state competing with with each other, and uh, by now. We should not. Uh, we should not. Uh, we should fight against the uh, left wing, uh, the the right wing nationalism. So we should stand the firm standpoint to refuse the war in general. I totally agree with the conclusion that Professor Musto present uh, in this lecture. Um, uh, my comment will be based on the distinguish between war and the, uh, other violent actions in general. So first of all, I try to use Max Weber's definition of war. He didn't give a very strict definition of war, but he did say that uh, warfare is a conflict among collective actors resulting to an uh, organized violence. So uh, because war is not terrorism, so collective actors who had the legitimate use of violence in our time is the ancient state. If one nation state is using organized violence toward another, this action is what we call war. So um, this means that not every action, um, violent action is war. It has a very important presumption that the subject must be nation state. As Professor Mosto mentioned in last lecture and you quote Rosa Rosenberg's, um, she tried to criticize some uh, theorists to justify for the war and she said we should uh, War, uh, we should take war on war and to fight against imperialism and preventing war in peace as in war time. But uh, the problem is she didn't mention the particular way or the method we should use to fight against imperialism. We could use some moderate or legal way to prevent a war, or at least we try not to trade or collude with the military if we have a legal party like a uh, British Labour Party or so on. But if we don't have a legal 
party or we don't have a legal union within the nation state, then the problem is we need to use some violent actions or some illegal ways to prevent war. But this uh, instrumental ways to see the violence is exactly what Marx Weber criticized in his profession and vocation of politics um, or the politics of Alice Bohu. He said, and uh, I quote uh, this sentence, he criticized the uh, uh, syndicist. She, uh, he said that you may demonstrate to convince the syndicist believing in an ethic of uh, ultimate ends that his action will result in increasing the opportunities of reactions or increasing the oppression of his class, but you will never take the slightest impression upon him. If an action of a good intention leads to a bad result, then in the actor's eyes, not him, but the world or the stupid, stupid the stupidity of other men or the God will should be blamed. Then, but this person is not responsible for the evil. Uh, result of uh, the actions. So by saying so, Max Weber is actually implying Lukács' attitude to see violent revolution only as a mean to break the modern capitalist system. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning of lecture that uh, Marx see violent revolution as a positive force to give birth to a new society. But you also stress that Marx didn't take it as the only way or the main way to the transformation of the society. Uh, of the society. So do you think it, there is a bit tension between the attitude to take violence as a tool, but at the same time refusing wars only because they have a different users of the same tool? Um, I'm asking these questions not because I'm a personally a pacifism, I understand that, that uh, some of the last left wing theorists criticized Gandhi's non violence protest and said this could not be advocated and uh, to use widely. If the victim or the weaker nation is actually harmed, they should, or they are at least legal, legally, should legally use the weapon of violence to fight against uh, the oppression. In, uh, in this way, Hannah Arendt distinguish between the resistance and the revolution. She said, by the end of rebellion is liberation from oppression, but the end of revolution is the foundation of freedom. I think Arlen make a very important point that the core of violence is harmful for freedom. So if we are going to achieve real freedom, we cannot use the same method we use to fight against oppression. At least it should be a, a different tool. Um, so Marx mentioned, Karl Marx mentioned in German ideology that revolution of the proletariat is different from the bourgeoisie revolution. The bourgeoisie revolution is one dynasty replacing another because they have all their special interest. Whereas the politist, uh, the, the, the proletariat has no interest of their own. Once they overthrow the capitalist state, they will put an end to this cycle. I think it's a, quite a paradox when it comes to war and violence. If we don't use violent revolutions or if we give up entirely the ability to use war, to uh, use violent, uh, then we could not able to win the first war against a capitalist state, which Marx called the political revolution. But if we use the wrong method, we could end up in endless revolution and could not win the social revolution, which could finally bring us the freedom. Um, I'd also like to bring about Charles Tilly's concept of co collective violence to explain why violence act could not stop even when the target of violence is eliminated or even when the final goals we use violence to achieve, uh, the goal is achieved, the violence could not stop. Charles Tilly said the group who used violence or the perpetrators is not a solid group. Within this group, there is a more active group who make orders or a charisma leaders who make orders and the passive group of people who only follow orders. So this dividing us from them will keep going after the purpose of violence is achieved.
um, I think this is an important problem for anti anti colonialism revolution. We can see many Latin Americans and uh, African cities. They successfully build up a nation of their own, but they soon being ruled by one dictatorship after another. I think Franz Fanon, Franz Fanon has uh, foreseen this difficult situation for the colonial state. He sh I think he showed a very ambivalent attitude in his book, The Vitriol of the Earth, arguing on the one hand that because the clon clonists themselves practice a naked violence, so the only way to fight against this them is to let them meet a greater violence. He's also opposed for the non-violence attitude of the native national elite, which he see as a compromising. But on the other hand, he was also aware that violence of the clonists could be harmful to anti-clonism movement, particularly after the victory of national independence. So Fanon realized that violence can actually change the mind of its users in a philosophical sense, violence is a systematic negation of the other, that it is not about the, the particular means we use, but it's an ethical attitude. So uh, let me make a conclusion of my uh, question. Do you think the left series hold a contradictory view of war and the violence act in general? And do you think this attitude damaged our standpoint to anti-militarism? If so, how are we going to deal with it? And uh, let me translate briefly in Chinese. Uh,我我来总结一下我的评论部分。首先就是呃，Mosco教授的这个论文的主旨就是左翼应该坚决的反对战争。因为战争从本质上就是资本主义国家竞争的产物，那么工人是在战争中受到最严重伤害的。所以，只要是国家之间的战争，应该被转化为工人在一个国家的内部，工人阶级反对资本家的这么一个阶级的对抗。那么，在
Okay, Professor Mosto, would you like to give a response? Uh, you are mute. Yes, now. Okay. Fine. Thank you very much. Uh, I find your comments very brilliant, useful, and I'm also very glad to see how many students and colleagues are writing in the chat. We are discussing a very difficult issue, and um, it is always very important to see that whatever we say, I use this um, methodology in general, but for this topic, perhaps more than many others, we have to put it into the historical context. And there is no way that I will be able to answer to something providing a sort of solution recipe that is valid to understand that particular historical moment or even the future or what the left should be doing, progressive movement should be doing now. Having said that, I will try to give one minute to each um, topic and uh, um, I apologize if I will be superficial just because I'm seeing that there are so many other questions ready for me. <clears throat> Max Weber has written this um, interesting thing that you called um, our attention. And you also mentioned the fact that uh, not every violent action is war. But I would like to say that um, one of the positive things of socialist movement, and I even use the word uh, civilizing example in my, in my paper, is the fact that they oppose workers try to oppose as much as they could these leaders that we mentioned in our in my talk that I mentioned in my talk, they try to oppose to war as much as they could. Max Weber or the other very well known sociologist of the time, Emil Durkheim, well, you know, not every violent action is war, but they supported war in the end. Both of them, they were writing this, uh, you know, nationalistic pamphlet. And um, it is um, very significant to see how the majority, if not all, the main sociologists of the time in Europe and also in the United States, in the end, they also were victims of this uh, uh, ideology of nationalism. So yes, labor movement suffered a very dramatic split, but at least the people that I mentioned in my talk with all their difficulties, and I'm going to the second author that you mentioned, for example, Losa Luxemburg, or for example, Lenin, I see that there are some questions on this, so I'm not touching this point. Well, you asked me, uh, Milan, how to fight imperialism, how to do this with the use, with the need, sorry, to use illegal action sometimes, particularly when you live in non-democratic societies and where, you know, the boundaries of uh, um, using, you know, um, let's say, uh, legal actions are precluded um, uh, some, sometimes. For example, you know, um, the case of Rosa Luxemburg was, uh, was a failure, was not uh, uh, something that they were able to achieve. You know, the idea of the Spartacism, right? The idea of general strike, perhaps this uh, too much enthusiasm in the fact that the masses could build this class consciousness and then do the revolution. But in any case, I believe that um, the discourse of Rosa Luxemburg is very, very relevant for us today. And I give an extremely positive balance on what she said, because she was able to call our attention, like few other uh, thinkers and revolutionary leaders, to the fact that um, you know, the opposition to war is dramatically essential if we want to really transform the society and have more chances to do a social revolution that 
um, it is not only a change of regime, it is not only a change of label, get rid of capitalism and put socialism, but it is really a significant improvement in the life of, you know, ordinary people. So when we are talking about Fanon, for example, and the risk of anti-colonialism becoming new dictatorships, right, or the risk of all this uh, you know, anti-imperialism not being just, you know, um, a discourse, but something that is also changing socio-economic condition of the society. So going back to the idea of communism of Marx, to, you know, the idea of anti-capitalism of Marx, well, I think that this is something very important and must be done, in my opinion, in connection with the opposition to war. Why this? Yes, I agree with what you said, Milan, that if we use, you mentioned Hannah Arendt, you were very brilliant as always discussing resistance and revolution. There were also some comments about Gandhi, right? If we use this means in order to achieve real freedom, then we should do it. And then, you know, this is a position that is majoritarian in the left. I mean, this is what the left has done in front of Nazi fascism is one World War II. And I was, of course, by no mean arguing that uh, Italian partisans should not fight against Mussolini and, you know, try to um, um, get rid of fascism. And uh, you also mentioned Latin America. Yes, if you look at the experiences of Castro in Cuba, of Che Guevara, or many others, um, violence was um, used and in many times also in front of very violent dictatorship who had cut any possibility of use legal means to change a political system, but they were also killing the opponents, like in the case of Chile against Allende, like in the case of Argentina, Brazil, and many, many others. And of course, not only Latin America, we should talk about something closer to China, like the case of Indonesia, just to mention one of the, the most dramatic things or the occupation of Vietnam, etc. What I was mentioning in my uh, in the end of my discourse, and I don't think that there is a difference between what you said and what I was arguing, perhaps too uh, superficially in my case, is that in the present conditions, I'm thinking about in the present conditions, the discourse of anti-militarism, the discourse of opposition to war, the discourse of having the need of building a society and also the international rules around the globe to avoid war as much as possible is something that for me is indispensable for the left. Because, and I have no time to talk about this in length, but I just want to say, and I want to ask this to the audience as I ask it to myself, every time there is a war, don't you agree, you two, that all the ideas of social reforms, all the ideas of improving the condition of human beings, housing, jobs, um, you know, welfare state, etc., they are left in a corner, they are reduced, money is now used to, to war. Don't you agree that the idea of a peaceful coexistence in a multipolar war is put in trouble, it's already complicated, it's not helped by, by war. And don't you also believe that uh, these things that I was trying to mention in my talk, the ideology that is you know, growing within each society um, involved in war, is very often an ideology that is creating this discourse of obedience, of order, but we need critique, we need uh, plurality in our society. And this is of course something that very rarely can be associated to an army, can be associated to war, can be associated to this idea that there is 
I don't know, a military leader who is deciding everything and other people should only follow up. And let me end with this, the question of ecology. Don't you also believe that the important things of fighting with justice and understanding that countries that have more should give up more and the so-called developing country are in a different position. But this question of climate change, this question of the ecological revolution is something that every time there is a war is put once again in the corner and is not the center with all the other things that I mentioned before of our political preoccupations. So if you answer yes to this question, or at least to some of these questions, or if you see that these topics are in trouble, where the discourse of war is coming back with so much strength, including the idea of using military powers, etc., we are able to historically locate this discussion. And we are trying to understand that the need for diplomacy, the need for reducing army expenditure, et cetera, you know, is something that progressive movement cannot leave anywhere else than at the core of their discourse and political program. I would like to say much more, Milan, but I cannot because, you know, it's already, it's also evening there, so I don't want to abuse the patience of the audience. But thank you for all your excellent comments. And actually, I will be working an extended version of my article that was just published in the limited amount of words in order to respond to the demand of seeing what the left has thought about war in the past. But the longer version will include this and will also include these interesting comments made by Franz Fanon or, you know, including Castro, Guevara and other revolutionary readers, leaders of the last decades. So thank you very much for your brilliant and very useful comments that I will use in order to improve my work. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your response. I've uh, learned a lot and take some notes. Yes, you're, you're very right that this point is valuable. Despite all the difficulties, no one say we should fight against war. And the left is the, is the left series is the only group of people who say so. Yes, uh, so I won't take up longer of your time. So please, uh, shall we move on to the next step? We answer some questions from from the audience. Could, could you pick someone? I, I, yeah, I think yeah. we don't have enough time for yeah. everyone. There are, there are some um, questions that I was able to read because they are in English. So I will start with them. And then perhaps there are other Chinese things that you will guide me and help me later. I will try to summarize this uh, very uh, quickly. Um, so the first one written by uh, Suica is talking about nationalism. So Suica said, don't you think that nationalism is an, a topic of concern since Engels' time? <clears throat> and then there is another one, perhaps you can help me, Milan, to mention the name of this uh, scholar of all the students, 156. Uh, what? Fifty-six. I, I don't. Just, I don't. It's just my time. Your time would be at uh, uh, eight fifty-six. You know, the one immediately after Suica. Oh, sure. Uh, Jiang Haoran. Jiang Haoran. Yeah. Jiang Haoran is talking about class, huh? uh, and um, um, social subjectivity for the revolution today. Is class still significant today, or only? Uh, marginal, uh, I think marginal sector, you know, Chowlan is talking about marginal population. I would say marginal sector are important for, for revolution. So this is about class. And then I read also uh, Hasi, Hase, uh, World War I, Lenin is in favor of the imperial war to move into class war, as I mentioned in my talk. And Hase talked about Stalin, anti-fascist alliance to defend bourgeois fatherland. So the question is, is this a lack of consistency um, in Marxism? Um, 
Um, and uh, I will take all of this question. Let, let, let me take one more and then we see the other one, okay? So that we perhaps can do this in two blocks because I was not able to read the rest while I was listening to you. And then YOLO talks about race, gender, and other factors impacting working class. So what we have to do today. Um, I think that I'm going to start with this um, question number one and three, and then I will connect two and four, because they are class um, consciousness and working class. So the first question, uh, nationalism. Yes, of course, it is a topic of concern since Engels. I, um, I tried all my best to to demonstrate this, and uh, not only Engels, actually, um, the emergence of nationalism, in my opinion, has been always a factor, a problematic, at least problematic factor, is if not a defeating factor of uh, socialism. That's why this idea of calling for, you know, internationalism was you know, the essential card of labor movement to respond to this. I must say that, you know, socialism, in my opinion, lost more time than won. And it is very, very difficult when the fever, when the malaise, when the disease of nationalism is entering into one society. This is also, of course, connected to racism, right? And this is also connected to any form of xenophobia who are at the beginning used within that society, like, you know, the opposition of Chinese people to work in your country, the opposition of migrants coming from Africa in Europe, from um, uh, Latin America to the United States. So these are elements, these are dangerous elements in political discourses that actually use, usually prepare wars. That's why you might want to be scared about the state of European politics today, because there are European right-wing or far-right-wing political parties that are using this discourse in every European country and they're receiving significant support. I'm not talking about minority party of three, four, five percent. I'm talking about big parties that sometimes receive 20 percent, 25 percent, one quarter of the electorate and are also in governments today. So, this enters as a discourse of xenophobia and racism and later is transformed into chauvinism and nationalism that can reach war at the very dramatic moment. Now, the question of uh, Hasse, the question whether there is a lack of consistency in Marxism before Lenin used the position and Stalin used another position, well, I uh, will not put it in this way. So I, in my talk, I think that I uh, discuss and hopefully was able to demonstrate in which sense Lenin used the slogan, turn the imperialistic war into class war, also sometimes the limitation of this, some other time the achievement. In this question of anti-fascist alliance to defend bourgeois fatherland, I would like to make a correction, if I may, to the question that I received. This is not true at the beginning. The Communist International at the beginning is actually fighting, let me use this expression, another ideological war against social democracy. Not only they are fighting against Nazi fascism, but they are also fighting against this um, social uh, chauvinist, the way uh, Lenin called them, and then Stalin and all the propaganda apparatus of Soviet Union, who had accepted war and voted in favor of credit war. So the beginning is not an alliance of all the democratic parties, not even an alliance of all the left. Actually, Trotsky saw this perhaps um, better than some other people because he saw the risk, not the only one, of the need to create this alliance. And this alliance, as it was done later, when they understood in Moscow that there, there was a risk to capitulate in front 
of the Rome-Berlin axis, later expanded to Tokyo with the imperialistic power that uh, Japan had in Asia, right? So the idea of create an anti-fascist alliance, this frontism idea, let's create a big block, a big front is coming later. And it is true that it's defending sometime bourgeois fatherland, but is this defending to the risk of having the entire Europe controlled by, you know, the anti-communism uh, of uh, Hitler and having Auschwitz um, um, being um, expanded even more than it was. So I mentioned this at the very beginning of my previous intervention in response to Milan, that we will not be able to go anywhere, in my opinion, if we do not put historical events into their political uh, historical and ideological context. So we cannot find a single position of Marxism. And also there were different Marxism, Lenin as a Marxism, Rosa Luxemburg as another Marxism, Stalin as another kind of interpretation, then some people will not even call Marxism. So it is impossible to find a line of, uh, you know, a position that is supported by all these political leaders or theoreticians, and that is also valid for all the historic uh, 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 events in history. The other set of question, uh, Chuhaland and Yolo, is related to class, working class. So Chuhaland, if my, um, uh, if my, um, um, pronunciation is not correct, but you know, a little bit closer at least, is talking about asking social subject. What is the social subject of the revolution today? And is class still significant? I connected these two questions, Yolo asking about race, gender, and other factor, because in my idea, the left cannot, should not um, ignore working class, or I'll tell you even more, place the working class at the center of every policy and uh, emancipatory project that they have. I am more familiar with European politics, with uh, politics in South America, than of course my uh, understanding of uh, uh, Chinese politics. But something that I might tell you that is happening in Europe, that happened in Europe in the past uh, um, decades, in the last couple of decades, is that socialist reformist parties, or even the more radical one, let's say associated with this idea of the radical left, has lost a significant block of the working class that later in some cases has supported conservative parties. You might remember that some of this analysis are also done in relation to Trump and the United States, even though we are talking about two very different worlds, because actually in the United States, the labor movement cannot be compared to the history, traditions, and plurality of European labor movement. But what you're seeing today is that some of these parties, in particular, social democratic, socialist party that embraced neoliberalism in the last decades, they lost significantly the support of the working class. And usually they have a support of uh, middle class, educated middle class, usually related to, I don't know, big cities and not to the peripheries or the uh, historical <clears throat> uh, working class places. This is something that can seen in many European countries. I better don't enter there, otherwise I will do too long examples. At the same time, there is an ideology that is taking place starting from North America, North American campuses, United States, et cetera, sometimes in connection, in connection with this idea of decolonizing politics, decolonizing sociology, et cetera, surely introducing important things, important elements of democratization of our society, of the university, et cetera. But at the same time, in my opinion, there is a very dangerous discourse 
of division, of fragmentation. So I come from the communist, from the socialist tradition where everybody feels that when there is something bad going on, everybody has the right and the need to fight against this. On the contrary, some of these ideas, some divide, you know, the fight against um, racism, against um, gender oppression, et cetera. And they talk about the right only to some subjectivities to fight against this. I'm talking about, you know, topics that are uh, familiar to, you know, scholars of contemporary theory and tendencies in North American university. This has a risk. This has a risk not only of uh, dividing, you know, the uh, emancipatory, emancipatory movement, but also the risk of making weaker, you know, the struggle against gender oppression, against racism, et cetera, if not supported by the entire population, if not extended as the worker movement has always done to you know, the entire working class. This does not mean, of course, that women can understand better what it means to be the subject of oppression of um, any kind that we can mention. But this is not something that can only be fought from that portion of the society. So I'm talking about a risk of fragmentation of the struggle, a risk that identity politics is entering also in the left, in progressive movement, and is creating an ideology that is not progressive at all, and that is actually a risk for these struggles to you know, achieve something and move forward. And I think that I'm done with the first block. Do you also want me, Milan, or perhaps you can help me so that I can also drink a little bit of water to see, I have the question of Nicole, the question of uh, Wendo Dai Sisu, and the question of Xiaomi. Um, would you help me by reading this so that also the audience can see, and then I will try to respond very quickly? Okay, uh, the Nicole's problem. Uh... He, he has two questions. Uh, one is that, why can't we regard the war as a possible opportunity to hasten the breakdown of social system and open up the social revolution? The second one is, uh, the second international was firmly opposed to war at first, but later many important theorists turned to support World War I. How do you understand such a change why do these workers easily turn to support the war? In addition to uh, patriotic, uh, patriotism or nationalism, are there any other significant factors lead to this change? Uh, this is from Nicole. Yeah, this is the first person. Uh, I'll respond to the, all of them together. Can you okay, read okay. the other two? So this, Dai Wen Bo, okay. Thank you, Professor. Um, as you analyze the Marxist understanding of and the response to war is closely tied to their understanding of the state, uh, state and uh, its sovereignty. How in socialist country like China, the emphasis on sovereignty is often take in contrast to human rights. So, uh, that's, what does Marx and Marxists think about sovereignty? Does Marxism have an understanding of human rights beyond a bourgeoisie ideology? So this is the second one. And the last one is, um, dear, professor, dear professor, in your opinion, if the Nazi party failed to seize the power in 1963, would the, uh, would the outbreak of the Second World War, Second World War be avoided? And if KPD or Nazi left finally came to power, what direction would the Second War, World War go? Uh, there, he, here's a new one from Jin Ren Shuo. Uh, Please. Uh, yeah. Um, taking into consideration an archi novelist inversion, uh, in, inversion by Hobbes against, uh, I, I don't know how to read this name. <laughs> 
Okay. That's a cause of this. Cause of this. Okay. That uh, politics is a continuation of war. Shouldn't we take a step back to refocus this particular characteristic characteristics of capitalist politics? The peace period, not as standing on its own, but still being based on its imminent inner through transform through transformed though transformed into peace war. Uh, sorry, it's a it's a bit confusing. As you already said, the two the two WWS are exactly the lack of the lack or failure of politics. Therefore, if if a true emancipation is to be made, the one must also be a rearrange rearrangement and the reconstruction of the continually repressing process of capitalist politics. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, I have uh, three minutes. So uh, the students or the colleagues who ask this question will be very um, patient with me. And I'm sure that there will be other occasions and uh, hopefully we can continue our discussion soon with other talks or in person when it will be possible to return to China. Nicole, uh, why war is not an opportunity for social revolution? I think that I answered this question at the end of the previous block. So I would like to respond to the second question that you ask. Why the second international changed their ideas? Why they supported, why workers changed position and supported uh, the war in the end? Um, and this is also something connected to the last question um, that uh, is talking about, you know, the need of rearranging capitalism, if I understand correctly, um, uh, Milan, you know, uh, continually repressing process of capitalist politics, right, which is, you know, a very important topic. So in answer, in a very superficial answer to these two questions, I would like to say that it is very difficult to go against the propaganda machine of war. And uh, it is, as I mentioned before, mm, a constant sometimes in the history of the 20th century that was a century that created uh, an extraordinary movement of emancipation, communist movement for emancipation of the working class, but also very dramatic episodes like the two wars that took place in Europe and then in the world, and then the many other things that took place, for example, in Asia that you know. So in the end, as I mentioned in my talk, the Social Democratic Party, the labor movement in England, socialism in France and in Italy, they accepted and arranged this idea of having more freedom in their country, like the end of the anti-socialist laws, for example, but supporting the fact that, uh, you know, the state was doing the war somewhere else and was, um, uh, using this uh, uh, colonialist and imperialist idea somewhere else. Also with the idea that there is an economic uh, outcome for them as well. And then of course, this is also full of this uh, uh, imperialistic discourse that I mentioned before and that uh, Lenin criticized so well, like, you know, being the last wheel of the train and there will be something better for you as well. But this is not what happened. Look, for example, the case of Italy with fascism and look, for example, the very brilliant uh, uh, ideas of, uh, of Gramsci, uh, how to fight a uh, fascist bloc. The other two questions are also, you know, um, one, is perhaps only partially related because it's about China and it's about this question of sovereignty and human rights. And the other one is about uh, Nazism, if they did not take the power in 1933. It's already one minute past 10. So I will try to do something extremely superficial and I apologize with, with the audience. I want to say this, in my opinion, 
socialism will last and win when these two discourses are not um, uh, one against another. So when social changes and social improvements is not against individual rights. If I look at the history of the 20th century, if I critically look at the history of Soviet Union, of the socialist bloc, etc., socialists should find a way to combine the struggle for equality with the struggle for individual freedom. And of course, we are not talking about the bourgeois theory of human rights, of human freedom, that Marx has already sharply criticized and attacked in Capital and his preparatory manuscript. When Marx is talking about your freedom is just the freedom of capital, is just the freedom of exploitation, we are in favor of real human freedom, which is working class emancipation. So social reforms and individual freedom together if possible, as much as possible, and not one against another. And the other question, yes, of course, if Nazi failed to get power in 1933, you know, history would have been very different. Only Italy was a fascist country at the time in Europe. But of course, these tensions were there and they were growing. And I want to end my talk um, building a relationship between the economic crisis and the political condition that led to the uh, took of Germany by Nazism and then, you know, World War II. Because we have to try to explain why this happened. And we have to put this into also another context, the economic context, the context of 1929, big depression, economic crisis, that is, you know, uh, dramatically similar to some of the things that we are observing today in our world, in our society. So this is a useful tool. And once again, Marxism and the history of labor movement connecting the economy with politics, with history is uh, an essential uh, instrument in order to help us understand our society. And, you know, as we often say, try to do all we can to improve it. Thank you very much for your invitation. I don't want to take too much of your time. It has been a pleasure. I apologize for having uh, discussed so many authors and so many theories, almost 200 years of uh, um, um, history, but uh, there will be also some translations and circulations of documents, and then hopefully uh, we could have uh, um, I don't know, a seminar, a one week seminar at your university when at some point it will be possible for me to travel and to visit you. So very, very grateful for your invitation and I hope that there will be a new one in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you for Professor Mostro's uh, answer. And then Professor Hu will put an end to the uh, lecture. Then we will give the time to the Kun Xiaoshu. 呃，非常感谢莫斯科教授和张米兰助理教授，呃，在马克思对战争和劳工运动的历史重建这一主题上为我们打开了全新视域的对话空间和深入探索的可能性。也感谢各位听众的认真聆听和积极提问。呃，期
in, invite Professor Mosto to the Department of Philosophy of Shenyangshan University for more in-depth academic exchange after the pandemic. Uh, this is the end of today's lecture. Thanks again for everybody's attendance. Please keep following the rest of the lectures of the, the international lecture series on Marxist philosophy. The next lecture will be on November 16, given by Professor St. Sayers. The topic is Marx's critic of Hegel's dialectic. Thank you.